The Connecting Communities with Peatlands project is investing in the local landmarks that are the peatland bogs. The project aims to enhance their potential whilst keeping them as the integral part of community life that they have been throughout history. Their potential is to be enhanced in three main sectors, tourism, nature and community. At their end of project conference, it was clear that the bogs, already local landmarks, can become multifaceted spaces for local life, economy and identity. Tourism and footfall is to be harnessed with coffee shops and boardwalks. A space for nature to flourish is to be created through wildlife and landscape conservation efforts. And communities can use the bogs as sites of events, guided walks and educational workshops. The conference was a space to share ideas, lessons learned and successes. It was attended by community groups, conservationists, activists, researchers and those with an interest in the bogs and their future. There's something unique about bogs that just pull you in whether it's the softness or whatever it is about them, but they are very soft places, they're very gentle places. There's nothing on the horizon, you know, except the sky. You, you know, the land meets the sky, and they're just beautiful places. I am a chairperson of Kativ and Tidy Towns, Roscommon. After turf cutting ended, it was hard for the people to accept that the place had any function, so we've kind of reignited the interest in the place and brought new life into it, and... People are now seeing that peatlands are a beautiful landscape, just as nice as seasides or lakesides, that peatlands have their own attractiveness. And people are really enjoying it for walking. We have a footfall track around it, and we've discovered that um, we've had 9,000 visitors to date this year, an average of 68 people per day, just enjoying it. And that's the nice thing to see, that turf cutting has stopped, but people are actually enjoying the place and enjoying the facilities that we've put in place. Yeah, they're not redundant. Exactly, and they're not wastelands. The whole thing was to see people, they're not wastelands. And they would be even better when it gets to restoration stage, which we're hoping to come to soon, that we can restore the bogs and heal some of the scars in the landscape and make the place even nicer. And they're places where people like to come, I notice, to be alone, to be quiet, um, to meditate. And we have two two roads reopened like that, which are, there's nothing on them except a poem at the end of each of them, a reflective poem purely that you can sit down and reflect and be quiet with your own thoughts and that's what we need more of in these times where there's so much coming at us on screens all of the time that we seldom get time to actually go out into nature because nature has solutions to so many things nature has the answer to so many things and that we can find many answers in nature if we just go out and look there's so much to be learned and they'll be very very attractive places and I see the potential is enormous for visitors coming to see what's happening and for young people especially to see this transformation happen, to see bogs come to life again and regrow. And they'll be drawn in the same way as hopefully I was yeah. and enjoy them just as much. Do you think there's going to be a change in the ways young people can get involved? Will there maybe be a job in the future which is a bog conservation? Will that be a job title? Do you- Definitely, I think there will be. Yeah, there'll be more. There are more young people interested in nature now than there ever was before, probably because the focus on it, they're learning about it in school because they have to, because it's, it's so important and it's so important for them. They now know they have to preserve nature and work with nature and not just be destructive. I mean, we were of a generation, I have to say, that thrashed the planet. I'm ashamed to say it, but we did. And they now know, and that's why I'm trying to do something with them also, they know that that has to be turned around and we all have to do a bit and we're trying to work with them and they're acutely aware of it. Mm. And hopefully we'll, they will take, there will be lots of uh, jobs in that field. There has to be in the future if we're going to preserve because there's so much bog land in Ireland. My name is Aoife Kirk and I'm the project coordinator of Connecting Communities with Peatlands. It's a project funded through the National Just Transition Fund and its main aim is to build capacity of community groups that are engaging with bogs across the Midlands region. So we're covering eight counties in the Midlands and we're doing that, we're providing training courses, peer-to-peer mentoring, resources for community groups who want to establish a project around their bogs to raise awareness, to do recreation, heritage, restoration any kind of level of engagement with their peatlands. So this project was funded through National Just Transition Fund uh, and the Carbon Tax Fund and that was released back in 2020, so the project started in 2021 and with that then we've used that funding then to um, coordinate this particular project around delivering training and workshops and providing resources for community groups. The bogs have played a significant role in the establishment of 
the Irish state, number one, for energy self-sufficiency. It was the only way of producing electricity and having heat in some areas of the country. And people's identity is wrapped up in that. You know, whole communities were built off of the back of um, Borden and Mona creating employment um, to extract peat for energy generation. And I think it's important that, you know, when we're talking about just transition, that, you know, we um, celebrate our heritage and our history. And yes, like we have extracted peat. We didn't know at the time that it was doing harm or that, you know, we were contributing to climate change, but it was contributing to, you know, the development of the economy and it was improving people's lives. So it was good in that, in that aspect. And we can't forget about that. And I think that's one of the key things about this project is that, you know, we have to kind of keep bogs as part of our identity and it's just kind of how do we shift that perception mm -hmm. and thinking and see the bog in a different way and use it in a different way that does benefit us but also benefits you know the environment and nature and the climate. Mm -hmm. I suppose that one of the things that we kind of wanted to talk about was kind of lessons learned so far through Just Transition and through this project itself in particular. Is there an example of a place where this has been done really well? Yeah, like there's so many. There's so many communities that are, are, are running these kinds of projects. So I suppose one of the, one of the ones that people would actually recognise most would be the Abbey Leaks Bog Project. Um, they've been running for 20 years. You know, a lot of community groups look to them for inspiration. They have developed various different trails. They've been doing uh, restoration of the bog and conservation of the bog completely voluntarily um, and, and raising funding for that. But not only that, like it's a beautiful recreational space for local people as well as visitors. And it's also produced employment because the coffee shop has appeared right beside it and it's a perfect spot and people can go and they get their cup of coffee, they get a lunch, they go for a walk, you know, you can bring the dog, the dog can get like a pup cup. Um, and so we're seeing that kind of being replicated. However, each bog and each place has its own unique story. So a lot of the groups are kind of, they're capitalizing on the fact that their stories are, are unique. So another place in, um, in Kiltiven, in County Ross Common, a tiny, tiny crossroads village. They have a bog there called Clune Large Bog, and the community there opened up all of the old bog roads. So very, very basic, there's no board boardwalk, you're walking around the edges of the bog, but from that there's a looped walk, you can access Loch Ree, um, and also they've developed a really nice ferry trail, so there's lots of like different messages and stuff for kids. And there's also a focus on the industrial heritage of the area, of the turf cutting. They found an awful lot of machinery. So it's a celebration of the biodiversity and the future going forward, but also a celebration of the past. It's kind of just a space that you can use to do anything with. It lends itself to whatever you want to do with it. That's it. Like, you can have so many different events. Like we've had screening events of, like, people's own kind of short films on blogs. And, um, you know, guided walks and talks. You could focus on, like, going looking at plants. You could look at the different moth species. It's actually fascinating because, you know, you get someone in who's an experienced, like, moth trapper and they set it up at night time. And then there's, there's like, um, these amazing um, creatures that you wouldn't really normally see that have, like, really good camouflage skills. And you're kind of, it's very, very eye -opening. So there's lots of different kind of things that we can do that people would just find fascinating and it would bring more people into the area as well if that's what a community wanted to do if they wanted to do a little bit of sustainable tourism or community tourism that kind of thing ceo of irish rural link seamus boland talks in depth about the aims of the project and what the future of the peatlands will look like including the employment lost and new opportunities for economic growth. So I think the project was as much an education project. It was a, a community embracing project, empowering project, and trying to get people connected with all of the agencies involved, even Bordnamona, even the departments, to try and can we make sure we get jobs that were lost or the equivalent of them back into the Midlands at the kind of pay that those jobs were. They were all good jobs. Mm -hmm. And of course, remembering that a lot of the jobs that were lost were men and very high powered, very high paid jobs. And we, we need to just be aware of that balance as well. So there, were, there were mainly mechanical engineering, uh, driving uh, skills, very much land, land management skills as well. But they were quite technical um, in every sense of the word because the, whether it was, you know, the, in, in the engineering side, the mechanical side, the driving side, and indeed the extraction of turf, all of that was, was 
specific skill. It was very well paid, and um, you know those those skills are no longer required now because we're into a different era. You know, a data center has a number of jobs, but it doesn't have anything like the scale of jobs that was there in the 60s and 70s and 80s, even 90s, in fact. So we, you know, it's not just that is one avenue, but we really need to try and keep the population in the Midlands, the Midland counties. Uh, and it's if you look at the, the census, that population is, is barely moving, and whereas overall population everywhere else. Aoife, who was working on the project and all of the other volunteers, brought loads of people together who had lost their jobs, people who were no longer involved in, in peat extraction, uh, to begin to look at, well, what can we do as communities? Because communities often have good solutions. You know, we, we're very aware of communities who brought, you know, water to every house in the country, so rural communities can solve a lot of problems. So it's to say, well, okay, we have this massive uh, landscape in front of us. It's now mainly bogs that were, uh, it's used bogs mainly. So what can we do with those? Can we turn them into uh, energy centers, nature centers, biodiversity centers? Can we attract kind of universities, especially on biodiversity, because there's a lot of uh, uh, science to be extracted in that. So instead of extracting turf, extracting scientific knowledge. And can we really, you know, establish a kind of a, a a, a, a use bog uh, center which effectively does two things it creates jobs and it creates a different use for now what is thousands of acres of land i think irish Link would and have been calling for a, another review of the whole transition fund program and i think that's not to criticize what's happened already i think uh, led by karen mulvey it's done a really good job but i think we now need to look at well what exactly are we trying to achieve here and what exactly have we learned from the last three or four years since Bordemona stopped cutting turf or extracting peat? Can we re what are we now saying about the bogs, the landscape? Are there opportunities to create the kind of jobs based on biodiversity, based on new energy centers? How do we look at that? We're in, a, we're in a climate crisis, so there's a lot of houses in the Midlands that need retrofitting. There's a lot of uh, different behaviors, transport, all of that needs to be reorganized. That has opportunities to create jobs and it has opportunities to reset. Remember when, you know, when, when the state was founded, the bogs were there and nobody knew what to do and suddenly we or our forefathers decided, you know what, we can do a lot here. We can, we can fuel the country. We can create energy and all of the rest. So they refashioned how we use the bogs. I'd like to think that Just Transition's next stage looks at how we refashion the bogs. And to be blunt, it should really concentrate on ways and means that actually create jobs and keep people in the Midlands. My name is Helen Mulhall and I'm the Just Transition Tourism Activator with Kildare County Council. Well, the fund that sponsors my role is a Just Transition initiative and it's called the Regenerative Tourism and Placemaking Scheme. Specifically, the one I'm promoting at the moment is for small and medium community and enterprise applications. And the idea of the fund is that it will provide investment for areas that have traditionally had their employment and income from peat harvesting and it will support them to transition into regenerative tourism specifically, not just tourism generally, as an alternative way to make a living and I suppose to work with the land and the natural assets there in a way that respects the land and also brings benefits to the community. So what sort of jobs are you thinking that they, they're going to create and what sort of tourism? I think the key is regenerative tourism and I've spent a little bit of time, you know, just new into the area myself, like researching what this means and trying then to communicate that to people as well. So very simply, um, it's, I suppose the theory is based on something called a vice model, but very simply it's net benefits or net gains for the visitor, for the industry, for the community and for the environment. And I, heard, I, I saw a lovely definition of it in a, in a newspaper article recently and um, one of the questions is what's the difference between sustainable and regenerative tourism? And the commentator said sustainable tourism is kind of a low bar, it's just not making a mess of things, but regenerative tourism is about making it better, not just for ourselves but for future generations. Yeah. I know it's really important to have the emphasis on jobs and jobs are so important, I mean where would any of us be without our job? 
but at the same time jobs come and go and there's a little bit of you know temporary can be a little bit temporary um, so I think it's about looking at all of those things together and I suppose we have to be a little bit patient with the time it takes to transition it is very difficult for our areas in decline at the moment to see that it's a big challenge to think of the longer term future when you're already in quite a crisis of change but we do have to think of I suppose looking at the place first and everything else is layered on top of that. Mm. And these bogs are so integral to the community, it makes sense to keep them integral and regenerate tourism by doing that. There's a lot of love for the bogs. I recently met somebody um, for World Wetlands Day. I went out to the Irish Peatlands Conservation Council and I met somebody who had been retired from Gordon Mona, had worked in the bogs all his life and is now working there as a volunteer. Um, helping with bog restoration and just you know cutting back invasive species and things like that so people's love for the bogs is not limited to turf they mean a lot more to people so while that's one very important aspect of it a lot of people just like walking there it's just important part of their identity and their cultural heritage not just from an exploitation point of view but it means a lot to a lot of people so i guess for wildlife conservation as well it's really important it really is and that's the thing about this type of tourism is going to be very difficult to the kind of economic model we had since the 1960s you know um it's it's a different way of thinking it actually takes quite a lot to find that out because you have to do your studies and find out what wildlife species are there which ones are protected and then that's the base that you start off with. So what, it, when people are looking at tourism, they have to really be honest about what is the development potential of the area they're looking at. Mm. And sometimes that's quite limited. So it could be like this very light touch type of development you're talking about. Mm. Um, so kind of no dig or very light little pieces of construction. Um, we had a really good webinar on the Fall Charlie website recently about sustainable accommodation types. Um, even things about how you do with wastewater are massively important in the wetlands area. So it's really important to kind of research these ideas thoroughly to understand the context of the area and to work with it rather than trying to control it. So it's it's a lot, it's a big ask, but then I suppose that's why we have to chase big funding for it. It, it requires a little bit of investment. So one of the things I think that's interesting from a tourism point of view is it's not just looking at tourism businesses, but it's looking at community enterprises as well. So I'm delighted to see that being included as part of the Just Transition funding. I know we would probably like it to be more things to more people, but for me that's a big win is that community enterprise is included. My name is Garrod O'Feel. I'm with the Scott Boy Raised Bog Restoration Project, the Clot Jordan Community Development Group. To the north of um, our village, you have a large bog, maybe about one and a half thousand acres or so. So about ten years ago now, we started a restoration project with Creature Forest. And there's been two other large restoration projects since to bring most of the bog under under conservation measures. Yeah. And in all that then we have about fifty private landowners part of that as well, which is so we have boardwalks, viewing platform, a loot walking trail, and so as well as it being a great for nature site, it's also a great immunity site that people love. And I suppose the it's I suppose Scott Boy then there's a strong connection, it was kinda of called the you know the, the, the country bog because it's where all the all the farms around like Jordan that side they all had turvy plots in Scarboy where the call it the village bog was you know a few kilometres away where every house in Main Street had a turvy plot on on them on that bog so in a way it's really kind of simple you know, you know agencies who have money they just need to provide money and then community groups who who it's their bog it's their land who know their neighbours help them get on with the work you know there's lots of plans there's no shortage of plans so it needs you know money and good agency people support local communities to to um conserve their bogs for their for their carbon qualities for their nature qualities and you know immunity put in some walkways and make, just make it win-win for everybody all around yeah. and keep it simple you seem like you're kind of and setting an example, maybe a bit more developed than some of the other bogs that are here, because you said you put the walkways in. Yeah, we're 10 years, pretty much 10 years now since we started. So basically, we, on the edge of the village, there's a, there was a, a deciduous woodland site. Yeah. So in one of our village enhancement scheme projects, we approached the village about putting in loot walking trails. So we put, we put in three loot walking trails with rural development funding, and then that was success. Then Creech approached us, would we like to come on board for this? life restoration project and their holdings on Scarboy Bog. We said yes and um, part of them was a, a boardwalk viewing platform and then we got funding then to extend the boardwalk, join up bog roads to make a 
a six kilometre loop walk, I created new trailheads, and then in winter 21 and winter 22, Parks and Wildlife paid contractors to do more restoration or rewetting works to bring most of the whole site into conservation measures and rewetting measures. And so very exciting, a great success overall. So where I'm from, there's no history of peatland conservation. So in a way, Skaha Boy went from burning and cutting to conservation over a few short years without any conflict. Good conversations. The restoration manager, initial restoration manager with Quilcha, uh, John Connolly was really good at his job, really good at talking to landowners. We had quiet conversations in the background with landowners. We're not sure about this restoration business at all, but there was active cutting going on and harvesting and selling of turf. Um, but between both ends, settlements were done and decisions were made and there was no conflict. And now we have a fantastic for nature and immunity site of great, you know, one of the most successful uh, projects of its kind in Ireland today. Kate Flood, I'm a peatland researcher with the Peat Hub Ireland project. I think uh, the Connecting Communities with Peatlands project has been a really great opportunity to show the importance of the, the work of communities, but also of supporting people, the networks of people, because it, it is people who take care of these places and um, we can put money and funding into restoring bogs and the ecology, but we also have to put uh, funding and support in place for the communities that are living in these places to make sure they can continue uh, when you know the agency maybe doesn't have uh, kind of staff on the ground. This is where it's so important to have communities engaged with protecting and looking after their bog. At, at the moment, the, the project I'm working on is looking at um, climate and biodiversity and uh, society and culture and archaeology. So we're taking a very holistic approach to try and uh, look at all these aspects of, of bogs and what they need, not just carbon credits or, you know, all these sectors from agriculture and farming, uh, because we know bogs under gra on grassland soils are one of the biggest emitters. So we have to work with, with all sectors. And I think in terms of research, um, we, we do need to understand that human dimension and the the social uh, drivers of, of what is, is harming bogs and then work on that to, um, to come up with solutions. We, we almost need more uh, bridging organisations and projects like these bring lots of different stakeholders together and uh, we, we need to look at the big picture, not just the carbon or the biodiversity. All of these things... Um, it's a com it's a complex system. Peatlands are complex ecosystems, and we, that's why we need to take a, a systemic approach to look at the whole system, not just parts of it. They're they're constantly changing. They're dynamic ecosystems. You know, society is constantly changing. The bog is constantly changing, and as Kieran Mulvey said today, we are living in very you know um, volatile times, and uh, you know so. It's that dynamism that um, makes it, in some senses, it's an exciting time and there are opportunities, but uh, it really, we, we have to work with change, not with stability. What you find is that actual in situ experience of being on a bog is vital to um, create that sense of stewardship and responsibility to take care of the place that, that people develop. and. Even though it has to be done right, you know, giving people access to these places is absolutely key to protecting them because, you know, you can't protect what you don't know. And there is that information gap as well that, that this project has filled. People um, who have grown up on, on bogs and, you know, have a different relationship, maybe cut in turf and they love being on the bog, but they may not know that they're uh, sundews are growing there or you know that that ecological side so it's a whole new way of relating to the bog and you know that shift has started to happen and it, and it's echoed more broadly in society I suppose in terms of shifting towards a more ecological 
and, and understanding how we're part of nature, not separate from it. Speaking with Will Faulkner is Just Transition Commissioner Kieran Mulvey, who has fought for the project funding that goes towards things such as new startups and enterprises, all the way to reskilling workers and training programmes. I suppose to go back to your appointment, this was in the wake of... What was that court case and the much accelerated demise of the peat industry and the halting of peat extraction and the many, many hundreds uh, and I suppose ultimately thousands when you take in the related jobs, Mm. uh, the people who were displaced by that and maybe reflect on the commitments that were made, the progress and the work that has still to be done. Well, largely, yes. I came into a situation where, as you said, uh, there had been a a legal decision by the courts, uh, effectively, which led to the closure by the ESB of both plants, both in Lanesborough and in Offaly and Shannon Bridge. And uh, Board Namona then being left in a position where any challenge to that legal decision, obviously their legal advice said it would not succeed. So they had to then pick up the pieces, a far bigger uh, number of pieces than the ESB did have to pick up in terms of numbers and locations, etc. So a lot of work went into adapting to that situation to resolve the industrial relations issues. I wasn't directly involved in those. There was a separate forum for that. But also then there had been a just transition fund allocated of 10 million for projects in the Midlands that would let's say soften the blow to some degree that would be spread through enterprise (coughs) communities uh, and initiatives around uh, employment. Uh, We managed actually to secure funding eventually of about 27 million through the projects we had agreed. Almost 60 projects had been agreed over that period and uh, I had issued a number of reports to the government, made over 60 recommendations. All of, nearly all of which had been acted upon by the government, uh, in fairness to them. And uh, one of the projects was reporting today on the wetland, connecting wetland, peatland communities uh, in Ireland, outside of the, both inside and outside the Midlands. And a very successful project that has been carried out in that regard. And But then the, the project funding, we did agree it went all the way from uh, new startups to enterprise to existing enterprises from the point of view towards reskilling workers, training programs, to engaging also then with the heritage tourism potential, and then supporting um, reskilling and education initiatives in the region. Mm. Um, I did. Uh, if you take the net number of jobs, so let's leave out maybe Board and Mona workers who have reskilled or been redeployed, but. How many jobs has Just Transition created? I wouldn't be in a position to give a definite figure, but certainly through our projects, we had identified probably 600 plus jobs that would come out of the projects themselves. I think that has largely been achievable. I think also it paved the way for a much bigger project that has come down the line now, the European Just Transition funding, which will be 167 million largely to be spent here in the Midlands region. Uh, half of which will be put up by the Irish government matching the European Mm. contribution. So there'll be larger, more larger, bigger scale projects. Already 18 million has been allocated to the region out of that, largely to local authorities to set up initiatives around heritage, tourism, uh, enterprise development. We supported a number of business hubs, which to some degree probably anticipated COVID, which happened in the middle of all of this, and the remote working experience that creates a situation by which you can identify areas, business parks, locations where people don't have to travel out of the region, where they can have access to better Wi-Fi broadband and then can do their jobs either for private industry or public utilities or public services without having the daily commute to Dublin, which there was about 28,000 when I started this. And of course, the whole situation now by law the situation by which we have a combination of um, office location and remote location that may be a business hub or home or whatever. But I think uh, private business recognised there was an opportunity in that as well. Leash Chamber Alliance, for instance, mm. was active in yeah. promoting working in Leash yeah. and even had jobs fairs to that yeah. effect. And yeah. there's an awfully jobs fair. There's one on at the moment, yeah. Imminently, which, yes. Yeah. I recall 
maybe late 2020, early 21, and granted we were during the COVID pandemic at that time, you were concerned just transition was on the back burner politically, and you did call that out in one of your reports. Given that you are now at the end of your tenure as Just Transition Commissioner, what happens now to keep it on the agenda, to keep the momentum going? Well, there's two developments that are happening. One is, the, as I said, the European Just Transition Programme. I think the learnings initially from my experience on the National Fund was... Uh, State agencies, government departments, because they're dealing largely with taxpayers' money, are probably risk adverse. I think in these circumstances, uh, we have to be pro-risk in the sense that local communities, local enterprise, startups or whatever it may be, are, are looking for seed money, support money, both in terms of bodies uh, on the ground in the sense, but also investment. So my view is it is better to be risk than risk adverse, risk positive risk. OK, we may have failures along the way, but that's the nature pre, of entrepreneurship. Yeah. To prejudge that, I think, is unfair. I mm. think we should be allowed. People should be allowed to be obtain uh, the support around that. Now, I know certain funds from private from the banks and from Enterprise Ireland and other state agencies assist that. I think, though, there's too much bureaucracy, too much paper around it in the sense that too much form-filling, too much process, too much oversight, too much overview, that uh, you get to the stage, unless you fill all the 10 boxes, you lose. I don't know if you've been through the frustrating experience of customer care or customer service and you think you've completed the flight booking or you've completed the order and then suddenly there's some other question that you can complete or you need another piece of information and by the time you obtain it, you've lost your connectivity. I equate it a little bit like that. If you get to 60 or 70 percent of the criteria required, work on the other 30 percent with them. Don't stop the project. Let the project start and work with them. Have a conversation. Have an engagement. Sit across the table mm. and see what the problems are and Is try that and get a, a cultural solutions. piece, though, in that I'm familiar with applying for grants to produce documentaries, yeah. and there will always be checks and balances when taxpayers' money is involved. So... How do you balance think, the rigour that's necessary? Yeah, and I think, in fairness, public servants, civil servants have been through this in my career all the time, that they are concerned that at some stage they will be called to account, uh, particularly before a, an Oireachtas committee where it can be very hot and heavy. I've been mm. through with a few of those myself. Uh, and uh, the rules of engagement are made up on the day in terms of the questioning and everything else. But I, I think we should be in a position to be mature enough to know when people have made a genuine effort uh, to complete the target of the process required of them. And secondly, that we don't penalise or publish or punish public servants for something that may occur, but in the long term was beneficial to communities, to companies or enterprises. I mean, I know we spend a lot of things on the big issues, the millions, but there's a lot of people in sub-million categories that are getting grants for the state, like some of the projects we're talking about today in the peatlands, connecting peatlands. You're talking about 300,000, you're talking about half a million, or you're talking about 600. In the broader scheme of public or European expenditure, it's equivalent to buying a Magnum ice cream in the shop. You know, it's, it's, it's small stuff. Some people might say, well, Karen, it's like 300. Low down. But when you think of no, the I effect and impact of it, I, I take it's your point. great value. R relative to the children's hospital, for instance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just we have to conclude. But on that point about the future and the representation and indeed the, the driving body behind Just Transition, you're recommending, and I believe it's been accepted, a commission to mm -hmm to take over, in effect, the work you've done? Well, I've muted that in, in my reports. It was also a commitment in the programme for government. And Minister Eamon Ryan took this by the scruff of the neck last September, appointed me chairman of a task force. 
uh, which involved major government departments, five pillars of social partnership. We presented a unanimous report to the minister in February. He's already got that through cabinet on the 30th of April. So we will be moving towards the establishment of an administrative standing just transition commission, which, and then a statutory one. Uh, maybe later in the year or under a new administration. The time period for legislation is very contracted at the moment, given elections and potential election. So he's moving ahead with the administrative body based on what would be a future statutory commission. So I have to commend him on moving that very rapidly. That will allow us then to have a, a representative body, which will involve community representatives as well. But we'll begin then to anticipate what areas of our economy and what areas of our communities will be affected by climate change and what impact that will have on employment, on social services, on communities. Uh, and to be able to anticipate that, plan for that, engage with communities, rather than the situation I faced uh, in autumn, winter of 2019, where we had to do in one year what was expected to be done in 10. Well, my name is Stoyan Chukanov, and I am a president of Beef Breeders Association of Bulgaria and member of the European Economic and Social Committee. Well, the involvement of the community. That's, that's very, very important because in many other places in Europe, the community basically just gave up. You know, they, they, they don't see any future. They just wait for their time to, to pass. And that's, it's, it's a very desperate. And here it's much more optimistic on what I'm observing and the, the conversations and contacts with the, with the members of the uh, community organization and Irish Rural Link. There is many lessons not only from Bulgaria, from all around the Europe, because there is many places where the consequence of the political decision related to the Green Deal are affecting the local communities in a bad way. So many people are losing not not only jobs, but their uh, lifestyles, and they, they are forced to move. And that's the point that we are raising on the EU level. Yes, we do have the right to free movement. What about the right to stay? Because many people are really deeply rooted in these uh, rural areas, and their, their life is there, you know, so suddenly because of the political decision they they must move so what are they doing mm -hmm. and that's that's the question how are we going to tackle this and how are we going to compensate and give those people the right to stay in the place mary fallon and i am chairperson of the Rahanine trailblazers during covid we started just walking and we watched one another coming from different areas at the bogs i'm from welsh island i love bogs i've always loved bogs as a child we used to spend our childhood jumping drains there was a lot of us in the family and that was, there was very little else to do and a day down in the bog jumping drains was my idea of heaven. So I love the bog. But uh, we decided then, a few people would say to us, you know, how did you get out there? So we decided, two of us in particular, we said, will you show me your routes and I'll show you mine? So we started doing loops. We developed five walking loops around the bog for, from 5k up to 15k. And then very naively thought, we just asked board on it because we wanted to pop a few signposts to show people that this beautiful area, you can walk around it. So when we very naively asked board on all of a sudden was, oh no, you have to get permission. You have to get, you have to be allowed to walk on the bog. And that was where our project started. So we've been working on that ever since. Uh, we've a group that uh, work with me. I'm very, very lucky. We have a great committee, and um, what we're trying to do is just get permission from Board Namona to walk on the bog. We don't want any changes. We don't need big money. We just want to be able to walk it and enjoy it. Our bog, we're very, very lucky. We have quarry lakes, which were created by roadstone, just digging into the ground and taking out all the sand and walking off, but the left behind a hole in the ground which filled with water and the water is now covered in swans, beautiful and you can even see little bits of bog oak coming up through them we have on the same route that we're trying to get we have a quilcha forest now I approached quilcha and they very kindly said yes no problem you can walk through the forest and 
for some reason there has been a kind of a divide made in the forest and you'd say, God, they're actually developing the walk for us. So that would be part of the walk. We also have the Mona River, fabulous big river uh, that you can walk down beside and it, it just meanders along. Beautiful. It's just beautiful. And again, the swans come up and down on that. Um, and then we have pathways, which I'm not sure, I think they were made by the machinery on board Namona that were just moving up and down. I used to think they were firebreakers to stop the fire from going from one side of the bog to the other. But when you, these are already there, they're just beautiful pathways and on both sides you have all the vegetation and you have the lichens and you have the mosses and you have, it's just beautiful. So it's already there, everything is already there, all we want to do is just to be able to get permission to walk it. That's it. For more information visit irishrollerlink.ie